The 16th century Protestant reformer Martin Luther said that the greatest question of mankind is, how can I be right before God? How can a sinful human be right before God? How is man accepted by the one who is holy, holy, holy? By the one who is perfect and righteous, by the one who is an all-consuming fire, how are we accepted in the sight of God? How can we possibly stand before God? That is the great question of mankind. Now, some people think that they are accepted by God because their name is on a church membership list somewhere in a file cabinet in a church. Some people think that they are accepted by God because all of their hard work that they've done for God over the years. Some people think that they are accepted by God because they went to church when they were little, way back when. Not anymore, of course. But that's my church. Some people think that they're accepted by God because they serve on a board or a committee at a church. Some people think they're accepted by God because they made a nice Christian Facebook post on Instagram or MySpace, whatever it may be. Well, I hate to break it to you, but none of these things can ever make us right before God. We are only right before God. We are only accepted in the sight of God when being convinced of our sin and misery and apprehending the mercy of God offered in Christ Jesus, we turn from our sin, we have a true hatred of our sin, we flee from it and turn to a God who is holy, 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 perfect, righteous, a consuming fire. That is the only thing that will make us be able to stand before a righteous God, that will make us accepted in his sight. Being convinced of our sin and misery, we turn from our sin and turn to God in, here's the word of the day, repentance. And it's not just inward saying, trust me, I did it. I did it once, trust me, just take my word for it. No, but true repentance leads to fruit. And fruit is the evidence of a true and lively faith. Fruit is obedience to God. The things that God has actually commanded, not just things that we made up to make us look Christian. We are accepted by God when and only when we take our sin seriously. When we hate that sin, when we grieve over our sin and turn from it looking to Christ and all of his benefits, the one who is the bread of life, This is repentance. And without it, no one will ever be accepted by God. I tell you, unless ye repent, ye will likewise perish. You know who said that? Jesus. Pastor Scott didn't say that. Jesus said that. Don't take my words seriously. Take the words of the Lord seriously. Unless ye repent, ye shall perish. Repentance is what we see in the brothers of Joseph today. You see, it doesn't matter that they have biblical pedigree. It doesn't matter who their parents were. It doesn't matter that they're the sons of Jacob, uh, the grandson of Isaac, the great-grandsons of Abraham. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that they were circumcised on the outside. It doesn't matter that they heard the promises of God. It doesn't matter that they were good at shepherding and made lots of money. None of that matters. What matters is that these men who had lived lives up until this point, questionable lives, sketchy lives, depraved lives, not pleasing to God lives, that these men are now perhaps beginning to show seeds of repentance in their life. Beginning to show fruit 
of true repentance. Repentance. No one will ever be right before God without it. Folks, this is serious. As we work our way through this story of the brothers going to Egypt for bread, that's what we're going to see. That Joseph's brothers finally repent. That Joseph's brothers finally repent. They're finally becoming Israel. The men we'd expect to see when we think of the fathers of the 12 tribes. Now, as we go through this narrative today, first, we're going to see that there was a famine in the land. There was a famine in the land. Second, we'll see the brothers confessing their sins. The brothers confess their sins. And third, Joseph tests the brothers. Now, remember where we are. We are with Joseph, who has gone through a lot over the last decade and a half. From being thrown into the pit by his own flesh and blood, to being sold into slavery by them, to being sold into the service of Potiphar's house, being falsely accused of rape, falsely imprisoned, unjustly treated, but then being brought before Pharaoh in order to interpret his dreams. And finally, Joseph has been exalted in Pharaoh's house, and he's now sitting over the land of Egypt with only one person above him in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh himself. And God has done this. We've seen this week after week that God is doing this. God is providentially arranging all of these things. And we're beginning to see why today. The seven years of plenty that he promised has come and gone. And now we're seeing a severe famine. We pick up in verse 56 of chapter 41. This is the word of the Lord. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the land. Now, famines are usually caused by bad weather, pestilence, bad farming, natural disasters, or, here's one, political incompetence. And we should always, like Joseph in this story, be preparing for something like a famine. Always. We should always be prepared for anything, including not having enough food. It doesn't hurt to prepare, even if it seems something like this could never, ever happen. We could never be without food. You never know what a day may bring, somebody once said said that now this particular famine was so severe that it wasn't just in Egypt but it was also in Canaan where Joseph had been extracted from taken kidnapped sold into slavery where his family still lived and we read in verse 1 of chapter 42 when Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt he said to his sons why do you look at one another come on guys quit being dummies I heard there's grain for sale in Egypt Go and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So it is a life and death situation for the brothers. Life and death. If they don't get food, they're going to die. Without bread, they will not have life. Without bread, they will not have life. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother. Gee, I wonder why. For he feared that harm might happen to him. Rightfully so. The last time he trusted the brothers with one of Rachel's sons, they almost killed him. They threw him into a pit. They sold him into slavery and brought this whole episode into motion. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So the brothers here begin a more than 300-mile journey to Egypt, and it's not the first time that we've read of the patriarchs going to Egypt, is it? Who else went to Egypt? Abraham went to Egypt, didn't he? Why did Abraham go to Egypt? Chapter 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to sojourn there. 
or went down to Egypt, rather, to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. It was then and there, if you remember, that the Lord poured out plagues on the house of Pharaoh in Egypt because Pharaoh had taken Joseph's, or Abraham's wife, Sarah, and added her to his harem. If you remember that. Ironically, now the grandson of Abraham and Sarah is actually in that same house, and he's over the land of Egypt. You know what that's called? Divine providence. God is in control. Now Joseph, verse 6, was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the peoples of the land. He's got all this authority. He is essentially the sovereign over everyone. And God has put him there. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. They bowed their faces to the ground before Joseph. I seem to remember hearing something like this a few chapters ago. Ah, oh, yes. It was in Joseph's dreams, wasn't it? In Joseph's dreams, they bowed before him. They bowed before him, and so did their grain sheaves. Interesting. And upon hearing this dream, you remember what their response was? Did they say, hey, that's a great dream. Joseph, tell me more about your dreams. Give me a big hug. I love you and I love your dreams. Is that what they said? No. They tried to kill him. And now it's happening. Because they tried to kill him. Joseph saw his brothers, and here's the best part, he recognized them. But he treated them like strangers, and he spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? It would have sounded different because he said it in Egyptian. And I don't know Egyptian. And then the interpreter would speak to them, and then the interpreter would... But Joseph knew what was going on the whole time. He knew exactly what his brothers were saying. And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. How come they didn't recognize him? Well, this is almost 15 years later. He was a teenager at the time, and now he's... A grown man. And now he dresses like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. He acts like an Egyptian. So his brothers, who haven't seen him in about 15 years, have no idea that it's him. And why would they expect Joseph to be the sovereign over a nation, Egypt? Why would they expect him to be in this country that they now have to go to for life-saving bread? They wouldn't. So in fulfillment of Joseph's dreams, the dreams that had his brothers bowing down and their sheaves of grain bowing down before him, the brothers are now prostrating themselves before Joseph. And Joseph, verse 9, remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Sure they are, except for when they're not. Your servants have never been spies. Joseph said to them, no, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, we, your servants, are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. You can tell they're nervous because they're babbling, going on and on, telling them the whole life story. Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies, and by this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, so he's swearing an oath. It makes it legal. You shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you or else. By the life of Pharaoh, again, swearing an oath, surely you are spies. And he put them in custody for three days. And we'll get into the testing in a few minutes. But the way I see it, it's almost like Joseph is a lion playing with his food before he eats it. His brothers are literally in his hand right now. And whatever Joseph says, think about this, whatever Joseph says will happen to them. If Joseph says, cut all of their heads off right now in my presence, that's what's going to happen to them. If he says, nope, send them back to where they came from, that's what's going to happen to them. Joseph is in control. It's almost as if he's in the place of God. 
So Joseph has them bound just like they did to him and put him in prison. Verse 18, on the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live for I fear God. So I'm going to ease up on you guys a little bit. I fear God. Um, If you are indeed honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine to your households and bring your youngest brother to me so that your words will be verified and you shall not die. So one of the brothers is going to be essentially a pledge, a down payment. Okay, I'm going to give you food. I'm going to give you some bread of life. You're going to have to come back, though, if you want your brother. So they did this. Now, as we consider this first part of the narrative, we see that the famine was severe in the land. And most importantly, the famine is a circumstance which God is using in order to bring Joseph's brothers to him. In fulfillment of his dreams from more than a decade ago, they seek bread from him. And Joseph seeks to put the fear of God in them. And he does. Fear of God is a healthy fear. You understand that? The fear of God is a true understanding of who God is, the one who is holy, holy, holy. If we didn't fear God, we'd go around sinning all the time. We'd go around throwing our brothers in pits all the time. Joseph puts the fear of the Lord in them. Ironically, the famine has caused them to switch places. Joseph is now in the place that his brothers were, and they're the ones who are now essentially waiting on his command to see if they're going to live or die. You have to wonder what's going on in their minds, don't you, as they're sitting in prison for several days? What do you think was going on in their heads? Well, we don't have to wonder. That brings us to our second consideration. The brothers confess their sin. The brothers confess their sin. Verse 21. Then the brothers said... So they're before Joseph now. The brothers said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. We are guilty concerning our brother. Just a few days in prison, staring death in the eyes, makes one consider their life. Makes one consider things that they've done. As they try to figure out, what could we possibly have done to deserve this kind of treatment, guys? You know, that veneer of self-righteousness. I've never, we've, we're such good guys. We've never done anything wrong. We're essentially perfect people. We, didn't, we don't deserve this. But after a little bit of time, they can think of one thing, maybe. At least one thing, right? Remember how we treated our brother? Remember how we treated this? One of our loved ones? Remember what we did to him? Truly, We are guilty. In truth, we are guilty concerning what we did to our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul. We saw it in his eyes, what we were doing to him as we were doing it. And we did it anyways. As he begged for his life. We are guilty. That is why this distress has come upon us. So, beloved, this is when it hits them. When their sin hits them like a ton of bricks. Joseph makes them face their sinful actions in prison. And it works. Their sin finally cuts them to the heart. They finally see it. What they did was murderous. We looked at our brother in the eyes and he begged for his life. And we ignored his pleas for mercy. We are guilty. And they're admitting, hey, we deserve what's happening to us. And so they come to their sovereign, Joseph, and they seek something that only he can provide. Bread that will keep them alive. And in order to receive that life-giving sustenance, they are confronted by their sin. They see it. They take it seriously. And so they confess their sin. What's this called? 
repentance. Repentance. In prison, they sat there and thought, we didn't do anything to deserve this. Oh, wait, maybe we did. Maybe one by one, they started confessing. They started realizing. You know, some of them are still probably, you know, I'm a good person. I love my family. I helped my neighbor across the street. Uh, I did good works. Didn't you see my Facebook post the other day? It was pretty Christian. I served on this and that committee. We're good people. But slowly but surely over time, they begin to realize, yeah, actually, yeah, we deserve this. We're guilty. When forced to sit and think about what we've done, hopefully this is what happens to us. We realize our sin. We turn from it. We confess it. This sin of theirs has been eating away at them for years. It's that thing that caused Judah to move away from the rest of the family for a time. It's that sick, depraved, murderous thing that they did to their little brother, Joseph. Why? Because they were jealous. They sinned against him because they were sinning against God. They didn't understand what God was doing with Joseph in their lives. They didn't understand Joseph's prophetic role in their lives. And now they're faced with the ramification of their sins. And as one of my professors used to always say, to those who hadn't studied enough, quoting Numbers 32, 23, your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. One day, your sin will find you out. And for the brothers, it did. They could not wash this guilt off of them no matter what they did. Why? Because up until now, here's the key, listen, up until now, they hadn't repented. They hadn't repented. Verse 22, Reuben starts preaching the law. Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you didn't listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. He's like one of those Old Testament, Old Covenant prophets. Just preaching the law. You're going to die. It's too late. Judgment is coming. Here's the best part of the scene. The brothers are talking amongst themselves. This whole conversation is going back and forth between the brothers, not knowing Joseph can understand everything that they're saying. They thought he was an Egyptian. Verse 23. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. But upon hearing them confess their sin, he turned away from them and wept. Why did Joseph cry? Because he understands that after all this time, after everything that he's been through, the ones who put him through it are starting to get it. They're finally repentant. He sees that they feel terrible for what they've done. They are grieving over their sin and they're hating it. So when he hears this from them, it moves his heart. He has compassion on them. He was angry. He was ready to pay them back for what they had done. But here we see he is moved deeply because his brothers admitted their guilt in his presence. In the presence of the one who has the power to give them life or death, they repent. In the presence of the one who is sovereign over them, they realize that they are guilty. A grief and hatred of sin, beloved, this is the first part of repentance. You know where that grief and hatred of your sin comes from? Faith. Faith. God has mercifully bestowed upon the brothers faith, and they understood that they have sinned. It hit them, like I said, like a ton of bricks. They don't know what to do. And so they confess their sins. These are the seeds of repentance. And Joseph is moved. And so now we come to the final part of the story. Joseph tests his brothers. Joseph tests his brothers. Really, he's been testing them all along, hasn't he? 
Is Tess are just Joseph being mean? Remember, God is using all of this. God is the one who's in control. Divine providence. What Joseph is doing in testing his brothers is trying to find something out from his brothers. Is the repentance real? Is it true repentance? Is there fruit? Verse 24, he returned to them and spoke to them after crying. He took Simeon from them and bound them before their eyes. That's the same thing they did to him. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. This is the test. Joseph gives them the bread of life, allows them to go their way, but he wants to see if the repentance is true repentance if it was really indeed repentance unto life. And so they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. And he said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. And at this, their hearts failed them. And they turned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? Guess what? They have the fear of God in them. But now they're convinced they're going to die. Why Joseph do this to them? Same reason he put them in prison. He's testing them to see how they respond. Are they honest men like they claim to be? Will they bring back the money? Have they learned from the way they treated me? Or will they leave Simeon in a foreign prison just like they sold me into the hands of foreign men? He's testing them. This is often what God does to his people. And beloved, being tested isn't always fun. You know that? Being tested isn't always fun. Can you imagine that? I know we've heard this three weeks in a row now, but it's worth repeating. James chapter 1, verse 3. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness or character. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The brothers are being tested. Is the repentance true repentance? Verse 29, when they came to Jacob, their father in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. So they repeat the entire story, and they told uh, and, and how they had told Joseph, yeah, we, we've got a dad in Canaan, and we've got a little brother Benjamin in Canaan, and we've got another brother who's dead. We told him everything. So as they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you're going to take Benjamin? Benjamin? And all of this has come against me. He sounds like Job. And then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. Now that's a little rash. Kill my two sons, really, Reuben? Perhaps Reuben isn't quite all the way there yet. But Jacob said to him, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is the only one left of Rachel's sons. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. So he's in the midst of deep depression here. And he says, it's only going to get worse, and I'm essentially going to die if I lose another one of my sons. I can't lose any more of my sons. He's over it. He's ready to die rather than lose another one of his favorite wife's children. And so the brothers wait. But the famine continued. Verse 1. Now the famine was severe in the land. And when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, and this is where we start to see Judah kind of stepping up a little bit, being more the man that we would expect to see Judah be as the one through whom the offspring would come. We had high hopes for Judah, and then we saw what he did a few chapters ago. But here, Judah is showing that he's changed. Repentance. Judah said, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. 
If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, he questioned us carefully about ourselves and our family, saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? We told him everything only in answer to his questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. Both we and you and our little ones, I will be a pledge of safety. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have now returned twice. And so Judah steps up. Judah shows that his repentance was repentance unto life. Fruit. Verse 11, their father said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags. Carry a present down to the man, a little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. And take double the money with you. So essentially, give the last bit of things that will keep us alive to him as a gift. This is a life and death situation. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise. Go again to the man. And before they left, the great patriarch Jacob blesses them. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And may he send back your brother and Benjamin, or Simeon and Benjamin. But as for me, I am bereaved of my children. I am bereaved. May God Almighty grant you mercy, Israel says. In Hebrew, it's may El Shaddai grant you mercy. What is mercy? What is mercy? Mercy is God graciously, not because you've earned it, but graciously relieving his people from an estate of sin and misery and bringing them into an estate of salvation by a redeemer. Mercy is God relieving us from death and giving us life. May the Lord have mercy on you. What he's saying is, may God keep you alive. Mercy is what is offered in Christ. That's what mercy is. Life. He is the bread of life, isn't he? And mercy, beloved, leads to repentance. By hearing the law, that we aren't good people. After all, the law says we're dead and we'll never be able to pull ourselves out of an estate of sin and death in Adam. No matter how many good works we do, no matter how much we went to church when we were little, regardless of if our name is on a plaque or on a piece of paper in a file cabinet somewhere, no matter if we think we're good people, regardless of our Christian Facebook posts or Instagram or Snap, we have to understand none of that matters at all. None of it. Because it would never recover us from our fallen estate. Mercy and repentance are tied together because repentance comes from realizing the mercy offered in Jesus Christ and nowhere else. Repentance is being broken before God. Realizing that we need him. He doesn't need us. Let me say that again because I know some people have it backwards. God doesn't need us. We need him. We need the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. We need his cleansing blood. We must have vital union with the one who provides life-giving bread. And when we realize our brokenness without Jesus, when we fall before him with tears, that's repentance. When we hate and grieve over our sin and we turn to him, 
and the mercy that is offered in him. And when there is true change, true change of mind, true change of heart, a change in our behavior, true life change, that's how you know that it is true repentance. Apart from the mercy of God Almighty El Shaddai, there is no repentance. We're seeing repentance here with the brothers, and that is why Joseph has been testing them to make sure it's repentance unto life. Was their confession real? Were their tears and grief over their sin real? Will they come and get their brother Simeon or leave him like they did me? Will they bring their money back? That's how you can know if it's real. Fruit. True repentance leads to fruit. True repentance leads to endeavoring after new obedience. That means striving to obey God, striving to produce the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, actual obedience to His actual laws. How can we know if it's real? Beloved, fruit is easy to see. It's also easy to see when there is no fruit. I'm saying that again. How can we know if the repentance is real? Fruit is easy to see. And so is no fruit. And you may be thinking, gee, pastor, I really don't think this applies to me because I'm already a Christian. I've already repented for the saving of my soul. I believe in Jesus. I've been justified. And even though I sin, I'm still right with God because of the righteousness of Christ. And you know what? Amen to that. But as Luther would say, to bring it back, Christians are simul justus et peccator. Simul justus et peccator is the way of saying Christians are simultaneously righteous and yet sinful at the same time. And so for any Christian to say, I don't need to repent, that's not fruit of repentance. That's showing that you're not in Christ Jesus. So this includes everyone here. Maybe you've never repented before. Maybe you've repented a thousand times. Either way, this is for you. Beloved, we need daily repentance, not just annual repentance, not just every 10 years repentance, not just one time. As the confession of faith says, we ought not content ourselves with a general repentance. That means just a one-time big repentance for everything. But we must repent particularly over particular sins. Daily repentance, beloved. Did you know that King David was a believer when he fell into sin and authored Psalm 51? You know that? You know Psalm 51? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, chesed. We talked about that, didn't we? It's almost as if that word just keeps popping up all over the place. According to your covenantal loving kindness shown in the covenant of grace because of the righteousness of Christ and because his blood have mercy on me, O God. That's what David says. Blot out my transgressions according to your abundant mercy. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is not just a prayer for first timers. This is a prayer for Christians. Repenting particularly over particular sins. Well, how often, though? Always. Always. Humbling ourselves before God. Coming before Him daily, hourly, with reverence and awe. For even, not on, the, even on Sundays, we know that you know, our God is an all-consuming fire. But what about Monday through Saturday? Is He still an all-consuming fire? Do we still need to approach Him with reverence and awe in all of our life? Indeed. David concludes, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me something that I've had. The joy of salvation. The apprehension of God's mercy shown in Christ Jesus. Restore that joy to me, he prays. 
That means he had it. And uphold me with a willing spirit. And then, and here's where you see this switch, I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Open up my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. So he wants that joy of salvation to be fresh in his heart and his mind. And beloved, let it be fresh in your mind. You've been saved by the perfect life and blood of Jesus. And it's through daily repentance that he sanctifies you and preserves you in Christ. I hope that we don't ever grow tired of hearing that. And I love how he says, and I will direct others to you, God. I will teach transgressors your ways. Pointing others to Jesus. Not just pointing ourselves to Jesus, but pointing others to him. And his cleansing blood. The mercy offered in him. And notice he closes with praise. And that's what the Christian life is. Repenting, believing, praising. And so, beloved, if we have trusted in Christ for our salvation, have repented and have been justified, then all throughout our lives, we need to be sanctified. And this happens through repentance, pointing ourselves and even pointing others to our Lord Jesus. So to summarize, we have seen that the famine was severe, but this famine is what God is using in order to bring Joseph's brothers to repentance before him. And Joseph, just like God often does to us, tests them in order to see if it's true repentance. God does this for us. In order to bring us to repentance, he tests us. Why? So that we would continue in that repentance. Trusting in him for all things. Hating our sin. Turning to him over and over and producing fruit in our lives, which is evidence of a true and lively faith. This is the Christian life. And so as we close, let us look to the final part of this narrative, verse 15, which is a bridge to the next section. So the men took this present. They brought an offering to Joseph. They took double the money with them in Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. How can one stand before God? Only in the righteousness of Christ Jesus and only with repentance. So thanks be to God, El Shaddai, for the great mercy that he has offered us in Christ Jesus. Amen.